Welcome to another monthly Beyond Zero Emissions Discussion Group. Firstly, we'd like to acknowledge that we're meeting the land of the Kulin Nations and pay our respects to their elders, past and present. We'd like to thank the University of Melbourne Energy Research Institute, our Zero Carbon Australia project partners, for this great venue. For the people who haven't been to one of our discussion groups before, Beyond Zero Emissions is a climate solutions think tank and research organisation. Our goal is to transform Australia from a 19th century fossil fuel based economy into a 21st century renewable powered clean tech economy. Our projects include Zero Carbon Australia Research, <coughs> Repower Australia Talks, Media Work, Education Programs and much more. We're always looking for more volunteers, so come and talk to us afterwards if you'd like to get involved. This discussion group is a forum for climate change solutions with presentations by experts in the field and is held on the first Monday of every month. It seems incredible and probably tragic that large sections of the human race would allow economic and political systems to flourish that allow and indeed encourage human practices that damage the environment of this only planet we have to live on. The upcoming Victorian state election in November is a critical campaign for our climate tonight. For our climate. Tonight our speakers are presenting practical solutions on how you can make a difference. Our first speaker is Ellen Sandell, the Greens candidate for Melbourne. Ellen is a science graduate, she's well able to understand issues. And she's campaigning on issues such as investments in public transport, not the east-west toll road, and strong action on climate change. The Greens are proud of running grassroots campaigns that are driven by volunteers. Help Ellen become the Greens' first low house MP in the Victorian Parliament. Would you please welcome <coughs> Ellen? Thanks so much. I don't have a PowerPoint or anything, so I might just speak here and then speak quite briefly so we leave enough time for questions because it's quite a small group, so I think the question and answer is probably the most interesting part. So my name's Ellen and I started off, I've been a climate activist for about 10 years now. So I started off as a climate activist, funnily enough, in this lecture theatre. I went to <laughs> Melbourne, well, I grew up in Mildura and obviously growing up in the country by the river and in an arid environment, it was pretty clear as a child growing up what was going on. And, but I didn't really realise as a child growing up that what I was seeing in my hometown was climate change. We thought it might have just been another drought, just the way that things were. But when I came to Melbourne University and I actually learnt climate science in this lecture theatre um, from David Caroli, who I understand you've heard from, it became pretty clear to me very quickly that, in fact, what I had been experiencing in my hometown wasn't <coughs> just another drought, it was the new normal. And this is the kind of weather and climate and problems that we were going to have to deal with for ever if we didn't have to, if we didn't take drastic, urgent action. So I studied science here and I thought that I wanted to be a scientist and I started my career back home in, in Murbeen with the CSIRO, but it became clear to me that in fact what we needed was not necessarily more technical solutions and more science. We knew what the science was, we knew what the solutions were, we just didn't have the political will to make them happen. And so I decided that policy was really the place we needed to go. And I got a job in the Department of Premier and Cabinet under John Brumby, the Labor Premier at the time, working on the whole of government Victorian response to climate change. And it was when Howard was Prime Minister and there was just an absolute vacuum of climate policy at a federal level and all the Labor states had teamed up to say, well, let us step in and, and try and fill that vacuum. And so I thought that that was a really exciting place to be. I you know, was working very hard on Victorian solutions to climate change, but I had some, some pretty disheartening experiences there that made me realise that the Labor government didn't really felt the, feel the urgency that I felt on climate change. Experiences where they just caved into the coal lobby, where they caved into a couple of uh, callers on talkback radio rather than what the science was saying. And that really disheartened <coughs> me because I guess I still had this little grain of faith in me that, that the Labor Party was going to do something on climate change. 
So after a couple of years there, I decided that enough was enough and that the politicians were more worried about their political future than our actual future. So we needed to make climate change a really top political issue. And so for five years, I worked for the Australian Youth Climate Coalition and became the CEO there. And our mission was to build a movement of people to solve the climate crisis based on the fact that it was younger generations who would be most impacted and we had a moral obligation to solve climate change. And so we ran various campaigns at a mostly a national and international level to try and pressure our leaders to do something about climate change and do it fast and do it to the scale that the science said was necessary. And I was, I was proud of being part of that movement and I know it's a movement that many of you are involved in and a very important <coughs> movement, but as the federal election came round, I realised that we were about to get a Prime Minister and potentially even a Senate as well who weren't going to listen to the science and weren't even going to listen to the Australian people. They were just out there, complete climate denialism, and there was really very little chance for the movement to influence these people because they were so influenced by the coal industry. And so while I still believe that a movement was very, very important, I actually realised that we had leaders who weren't listening to anybody. And so we needed to just replace them. And so I moved to Canberra for six months last year to run the ACT Greens campaign to try and elect Simon Shape, who used to be the head of Getter, to try and elect him to a Senate position and take that off a Liberal. So it was a, a race between a Liberal and Simon as a Green. And if he had been elected, the numbers in the Senate would look very different and the Greens would have been able to retain balance of power, save some of our clean energy laws, but more importantly, strengthen them and ramp them up because, as we know, our federal clean energy laws were pretty inadequate, but they were designed intentionally to be able to be ramped up quite quickly. But we can't do that if, if the people in power don't have the intention to do that. So I worked very hard to try and get a green imbalance of power, and unfortunately we missed out by just 0.6 of a percent. So that was quite devastating to see not only Tony Abbott elected, but to see him and his coal baron mates get balance of power and control in the Senate. So it was really a hard time for me and afterwards I did a lot of soul searching and I looked around and I thought, me as someone whose primary motivator is solving climate change, although I care about other social issues obviously as well, but that's my primary motivator, where does one go? Do I go overseas and try and work in America or China or somewhere where maybe some solutions are going to come to the fore when they're not in Australia? Um, do I go back to the NGO movement and try and push for change? It, I looked around for the best opportunity and I found the highest leverage opportunity here in Melbourne in my hometown where I had lived since I moved here from the country. And I just want to talk a bit about why I decided to run for the Greens in Melbourne. It's the first time I've ever run for a political party. but. I felt like it was the, the most important thing that I could be doing right now. And the reason is that, as many of you would know, the Victorian seat of Melbourne is very marginal between Greens and Labor. In 2012, there was a by-election and only a few hundred votes decided it. The Greens won on first preferences, but just lost out on second preferences. So if only three or 500 people or around about there had changed their vote, we would already have a Green in the lower house. And so it was a very, very marginal seat, so there is a really good chance that the Greens could win, although we need to do a lot of work to make us win. It's, it's definitely not a done deal. But also the numbers in the Victorian Parliament at the moment, as you all know, the, the Liberals only hold government by one seat, and that seat is held by Jeff Shaw. And the crazy man from Frankston who doesn't even believe in a woman's right to choose, <coughs> let alone action on climate change. And... So there is a very real possibility if things are close like they were last time, the polls are looking like it might not be so close, but you know the polls were very similar last time as well and it was really close, that the Greens could win maybe Melbourne, um, Tim Reid, our Brunswick candidates here as well, potentially Brunswick or Paran or Richmond or Northcote, some of these inner city seats, if we win those, we could have Pat Balance of Power in the lower house and there are a number of upper house seats that we could also pick up, such as Western Victoria, where we could actually get balance power in both houses. And although Victoria might seem small fry in terms of 
it's not the federal senate that can set federal climate laws. There are some things in Victoria that have a huge impact on the global climate. As we know, we have the dirtiest source of power in the whole world in brown coal, and our government and the Labor Party both would like to export that to the rest of the world. Having balance of power could stop that in its tracks. Having balance of power could shut down coal power stations like Anglesey, like Hazelwood, like your lawn power stations that, as a student, I went and tied myself to and, and tried to get them shut down, and that was 10 years ago. Um, it could protect our forests in the Central Highlands. We know that the scale of action we need on climate change is so fast and it's so urgent and so overwhelming that not only do we need to transition our energy sources, but we need to take carbon out of the atmosphere. And the lungs of our state, these beautiful forests in the Central Highlands, are currently being logged and we pay as taxpayers to log them, which is just ludicrous. Protecting those forests can provide a really important carbon sink. Um, and obviously transitioning to renewable energy. We've got a Liberal government who has these draconian anti-wind fund laws. There's billions of dollars of investment just sitting there in Western Victoria in particular that's locked up because of the Liberal government. You can have a coal mine next to a primary school in somewhere like Anglesey, but you can't have a wind farm within two kilometres of your town. It's just ludicrous. So some of these things are... Although Victoria is only one part of our nation, which is only one part of the globe, Victoria has some of the most carbon intensive energy and is really leading the world in terms of climate destruction. And if we could elect some Greens here and have balance of power, we have a unique opportunity to really stop some of that in its tracks. And I know that electing a Green in Melbourne is not the only thing that's going to solve climate change, but as one person, you have to think to yourself, where's the highest leverage opportunity? Where's the place that your skills and talents can be put to use on the thing that you know is the most important challenge of our generation? And for me, Melbourne seems like such a good opportunity and having a climate champion in Parliament has got to be better than having Jeff Shaw in the balance of power. So that's the reason why, why I'm doing this and putting my heart and soul into it and I've I'm not working this year, I'm just doing this full-time volunteering because I feel so passionately that we need climate champions in all levels of parliament, but this year in particular, this opportunity is somewhere that um, could really, really make a difference. It's not just one voice in a you know, sea of climate denialism, it, it could be the voice that's really the linchpin, the thing that changes things. So um, that's why I'm doing it. and. Um, yeah, I'd love to answer your questions after we hear from other speakers. So you just heard from the first of a feast of three speakers that we have tonight. And the second speaker is Adrian Whitehead. Adrian is a 25-year environmental campaigner, educator and public speaker and co-founder of VZE as well as Save the Planet. Adrian founded Save the Planet after he saw a need for a party to focus on global warming and call for solutions that actually have a chance of saving us. Would you please welcome Adrian? So, um, Miwa asked me to come and talk about the. Ooh, uh, asked me to come and talk about the uh, talk. Give a talk that I gave at the Breakthrough Conference. Just a show of hands. How many people made it to the Breakthrough Conference? About Three or four? Okay, cool. Um, so the Breakthrough <coughs> Conference was uh, a bunch of people who understand that climate change is very serious and that we need to do emergency speed transition to negative emissions as fast as possible. And the conference was a dedicated conference that looked at all, all the aspects of that, from solutions to the science that justifies that logic to um, politics to you know engaging the elites within society, all, all across it. So what, what normally happens in our climate movement at the moment is you have a sort of segmented sort of spread of groups that are arguing for relatively mild change versus groups that, as I see it, and it's sort of why we found it beyond our emissions, run what we consider the, the line that gives us the best chance of actually surviving into the future. So Breakthrough Conference was a dedicated conference that just focused on that. And this is the talk, if I can, that popped up before. So I'll just give me 10 seconds, I'll try and make it. 
Yeah, there's the button for that. <coughs> Yes. And then kill it. Cool, thank you. Is that the best light? Good. Right. So, um, but what I'll do, so Miwa asked me to give, give the little talk that I gave on one of the two um, sessions that I spoke at, but I will indulge myself with this audience just to give a bit of backstory um, before I race through this talk. Um, so when, when, when me and Matthew um, first campaign together. So Matthew's the other founder of Beyond Zero Emissions. It was about 2003 and we got together because people, including the ACF, were a part of the Australian Conservation Foundation were opposing wind farms being built in some areas. Okay? So we thought, oh my God, isn't this stupid? Wind farms are probably the most benign, large scale source of power you can, pro you can possibly do. Um, why are people opposing it? And we started campaigning for them. And no, no other environment group was sort of doing that at the time. And even ACF was opposing the Bald Hills Wind Farm, which is a completely legitimate wind farm down near Wilson's Prom. So we started, and we started campaigning, and that led us to look at climate change. As soon as we looked at climate change, more or less, we went, oh my God, we're gonna die. Um, and that, that then looked as well, what are we gonna do to save ourselves? And from that point onwards, we campaigned. Um, we brought Beyond Zero, Beyond Zero Emissions into existence um, in about 2005 or 6 um, when I came back after resigning a job in Canberra when I was working for the, the Cons Council in Canberra and was asked to campaign for 60% target by 2050. And I said, you've got to be kidding me, that's a death sentence to the planet. There's no way I'll stand in front of any organisation and ask for that. But that target at the time was the target of the Greens. It was the target of most of the major environment groups. And after resigning my position, we came down to Melbourne, we had a meeting, we decided to set up several things. Philip Sutton's there, who's hopefully speaking tonight, is he in the room? Yep. Yeah. He's possibly got run over on his way here on his bike, so let's hope that didn't happen. Um, so, um, so we, we, we fill up Philip's Greenleaf Strategic Institute was part of it, Beyond Zero Emissions was part of it, and those two things did quite well, and Beyond Zero Emissions did amazingly well. The two bits that failed was a network of hardcore climate groups to campaign on the, the emergency solution, and the other thing that failed was a project called Vote Climate. And the, the Vote Climate project was a critique of all the political parties that were playing in any election, and it was critiquing them against the climate emergency suite of solutions, and giving them ticks and crosses and trying to create a sort of drag to drag them across the climate emergency suite of solutions. It only successfully moved one party, and that party was um, Socialist Alliance to that position, right? So, and the Socialists are quite clever. You know, they see an opportunity, climate was big, and, but they wanted the real solutions. They didn't want a, a, a half-assed solution or, or what, something that wasn't going to save us. So they actually adopted something decent. So um, we did that, and then Vote Climate got captured by a more softer version of, of the movement, and it basically became a tool to save Vote Green and it lost its ability to actually, it basically gave Greens full tips, and it's lost its ability to drive the agenda around climate policy to try and shift the spectrum, right? So, hence why we come to save the planet. So, having been a bit despondent, having campaigned since 2003 on climate change, the fact that only Socialist Alliance is running anything like a climate emergency policy, um, there needed to be something that was going to shift the political spectrum. So we set up Save the Planet with a view to doing what One Nation did to the political spectrum, but in a positive way. Um, so rather than dragging it to the horror of the, the racist right, we want to drag the political spectrum to the solutions around climate change. So um, that's sort of the backstory of it all, and that's why I set up Save the Planet. So Save the Planet's running candidates at this election. We've just submitted our Victorian party registration, so we should be on the ballot <coughs> paper as Save the Planet Party at the next election, and we've just got our official incorporation today, so we're sort of moving ahead. Um, and um, I just encourage you, if you want to learn a bit more about us, have a look at this flyer out on our stalls, and um, I've got merchandise as well. <laughs> so, it's all good. All right, so political campaigning, 12 key points. Um, okay, so the bottom line is... If we actually, and I assume at a Beyond Zero Emissions discussion group, you guys know what the, the real message is, okay? So we've got to go to negative emissions as fast as possible. That's probably 10 years. We have to do it economy-wide. 
across all the different sectors, agriculture, forestry, transport, um, industrial processes and stationary energy, etc. And if we actually want that to happen, we have to say, the, the first thing we need to do in politics is we need to message, 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 and we actually have to say that out there in the political sphere. Because the reason we chose Save the Planet as a name is some people actually don't get that there's a need to even save the planet at this stage, and even huger proportion of society don't even know what the solutions are. So it's basically, if we want the things like the Beyond Zero Emissions um, Station Energy Plan, we have to just repeat that message again and again and again. Right, so that's, that's the first important point. The second important point is message, message, message. Um, if we want an actual safe climate, we've got to ask for it again and again and again. And you'll be surprised to see what the third point is. <laughs> there it is. And it's, I, can't under, I, I can't explain that enough. You actually have to say what we want, right? So part of the problem is if we don't say what we want, we're not going to get it. So I, I was really inspired by Alan. I hope Alan's going to bring the Labor government down when they fail to implement a climate emergency policy in the next time in Parliament, and that's wonderful. Um, but what we see is something like the Greens <coughs> advertising at the moment, like Tim's posters I saw up at Ceres say, we're doing what matters, right? And that's wonderful. Um, it's an artfully vague statement designed to, for you to insert whatever your particular value you associate with the Greens into. What it doesn't say is the planet's at stake in what we do in the next 10 years and we have to implement that, right? So that's the sort of messaging that we need to do if we actually want to achieve. That needs to be the Greens' number one argument, it needs to be Labor's number one argument, it needs to be Liberal's number one argument. Because the solution to climate change will be a political solution. It will occur for one of two reasons. It will occur because parties like Save the Planet or Socialist Alliance or the Greens have taken so much power that they're forming the government and implementing the reality, or the education effort that BZE and the talks that James has <coughs> organised in the past and the broader climate emergency movement has done has been so successful we've moved Labor to that position, significant parts of Liberal, and not, not to a 5% target, I mean a climate emergency target, and they adopt it and we see a Greens Labor coalition actually implementing that solution. Or three, and probably at this stage the most likely outcome, is that we are getting smashed by repeated terrible and catastrophic climate events and it becomes sadly completely obvious to everyone across the political spectrum and regardless of where they originally stood, eventually a government of the day implements the climate emergency response. But if we wait to that last point, it is quite possibly too late. It's no reason not to implement it because it may not be too late, we just don't know. So, the point is we need to get there before we get to that last of the three options. Okay, stretch goals. So, um, in campaigning, what you should do is just, if you want a national park this big, you ask for one this big, and then get it argued back to this big. What the environment movement tends to do, if they need one this big, they'll ask for this and accept that, or that, right? That's, that's what we do. We cut back our goals first, and then get less. So. The op uh, uh, people we campaign against don't do that. They argue for twice as much and accept more than they, their minimum position. So it's a very, but unfortunately for us, the safe climate position is the stretch. Our stretch goal is the best chance we can give human society from failing. All right, that's, and there's nothing else. That's the only goal that's worth implementing. Everything else is pointless. Or a, or a crime, one or the other. All right, so step five of how to campaign politically is we link to values, right? So um, it's a big mistake to go out there and preach the converter. You need to be able to knock on a door and say, what's your particular value set? And then try and link climate change into it. And the example I gave at Breakthrough was knocking on the door and the person says, um, oh, so I'm the knocker, right? Um, so you voted for Ricky Muir's uh, motoring enthusiast party. Well, have you heard of the Tesla P85? It can do zero to 60 miles per hour in under four seconds. Seriously, it's not a classic, but it's the classic of the future. Now, I assume not many of you actually understood what I said. Yeah, good. But you're not meant to, right? You are not meant to because you're not that audience. But for a hardcore motoring enthusiast, the zero to 60 mile per hour under four section time frame is a critical test of a car's <coughs> performance, which they understand and will care about. And the fact that we have an electric car that's zero emissions that can do that is a gateway to discussing something else. All right? So we have to learn to communicate with people of different value set. And the most important people, and your most important skills, I would argue, 
are what value sets and what links do you have into people who aren't? You know, what are you? Spe- why are you special? Are you a hardcore born again Christian? Are you? Are you a motoring enthusiast? Whatever. You're a hunter. You know, what what skills and what values can you insert into the climate debate to bring the arguments into a different set of people's thinking, which is not commonly there? Does that make sense? Yeah. So, um, link to solutions. So, the thing that we did, Matt, me and Matt, from the very, very start, is we had all the solutions, not just renewable energy or going solar or whatever. We had all the, all the solutions as we saw it, and we always said, this is the really big problem, and these are the really big solutions. And Beyond Zero Emissions' mission, in effect, is to produce the documents that argue those solutions out, all right, to make them believable. And if you don't link the solutions to the problem, as a balance, you fail. So, and it comes. This logic, this science, comes from medical messaging, where you say, "You've got a really serious cancer. If you if you don't, then match it with we've got a really pretty hardcore set of medical procedures you can go through. You may not come out of it alive. If you say anything less than that, people will turn off. If you say just go home and have a rest, they'll just switch off. So, if we say there's a really serious problem with the world on climate change, we have to match it with the really hardcore, sweetest solutions. All right. Am I getting the two minute wind up? Pretty well. Okay, I'll zip through the last one. All right, so politicians are all what? And um, they're followers, not leaders. I'd argue um, Alan's probably a leader, so that's good to see. Um, these are the standard politician, the scum, right? So the reason, the, the reason will not motivate them. They follow the money, they follow the power. They can be bribed, bought, or coerced, all right? So they're the people we're playing against at the moment. So that's, that's the game we're in, all right? Um, so the choice is money or power. Do we have any money? No. Does anyone in the money have any money, by the way? Anyway. <laughs> um, therefore, we must coerce. So coercing means moving votes, all right? So it mo- means in marginal seats, moving votes away from Labor to the Greens. And in Liberal Labor marginals, it means moving votes from Liberal to Labor at the moment. All right? So now here's some traps. Labor is always better than Liberal. So this is what trapped the environment movement for the decade of the 90s. So when the environment movement went out to an election, Labor was always better than Liberal, and it paralysed the movement in terms of power. They said, we can't support the Liberals. Labor's in power, but if we go to the Liberals, they're going to do it worse. Therefore, we'll just support Labor. Labor goes, do we have to give anything to the environment movement? And what's the answer? No, because they're always going to support you. So we take that resource and we give it to a swinging policy group or lobby group, right? So unless you're willing to pay politics with power, you have shot yourself in the foot and you can't go anywhere. You've dispowered yourself. Now, there's another one. We potentially will get there with Greens versus Labor as well, all right? So it's the same sort of argument. If we always just go the Greens and the Greens don't step up, then we'll and be in the same trap. Okay. Um, so finally, um, yeah, there's, there's quite a lot of stuff in there. You can ask me questions, but there's concepts are, are you idealist, realist, or radical, or opportunist? So that's how we can analyse ourselves to see who we are in our belief structures, and then that affects how we can campaign. Are you anti, what's your motivation political? Are you anti-labour, pro-green, um, pro-labour, or you're actually, a cons- you know, are you pushing the climate thing? Uh, what about incrementalism, left, right, blah, blah, blah. All right, so I've overshot my time and I'll finish on this. What's this? Ads of Coke. Do we still see ads of Coke today? Yeah. Do we always see ads of Coke? Mm-hmm. Well, well, not always. If, if you see it on telly, it's there year after year after year after year, right? So even Coke, one of the most well known brands, says its message again and again and again. And they link it to sexy stars or sexy women or love or smiles or happy young people. It's values linking to repetition of message, all right? Or again and again and again by one of the most powerful images and products in the world. We have a product which is the world is fucked unless we do X, Y, and Z and we have to work out how to translate it into this, all right? So it's a big challenge and we look forward to discussing it. <laughs> Our third speaker is Philip Sutton, and I couldn't introduce Philip without giving this book a plug. Philip and uh, David Spratt co-wrote Climate Code Red, and if you haven't read it, you should. It just um, the, the amount of dimensions in there. 
um, that measure the problem. Uh, it's a fabulous resource for really understanding climate change. And David Spratt, I believe, has a project going at the moment where he thinks the NGOs do not understand climate change and he thinks they need educating. And I think the general public needs educating. So there's a lot of work to be done. Um, if I could also say about Philip, he is the manager of research and strategy for transition initiation. He's also Save the Planet team leader for the development of a community mobilisation plan for the emergency restoration of a safe climate for the Darabin, Darabin municipality. Would you please welcome Philip Sutton. Thanks very much. I'll just uh, find out where pa oh, page up and page down. I think we're in business. Yep. Okay. Um, what I want to present is um, a context for uh, the coming Victorian election, but in particular also beyond that. Um, some of this stuff you'll know already, but the current climate is dangerous. The IPCC itself is even beginning to say that. Two degrees is far too hot. It's only going to get worse and worse unless we restore a safe climate. There is no carbon budget left. We must do zero emissions and draw down to get rid of all the excess CO2 in the air right now. Now, that's what we need to do. Um, what's the program that delivers that? Um, in 2009, the Worldwide Fund for Nature um, put out a report on industrial mobilisation, which is a, a magnificent sort of complement, supplement, if you like, to what the BZE reports are, where they analysed how would you do the too hot two degrees by 250, uh, uh, to 2050? Um, and they said that unless you were mobilising industries at the rate of 30% growth rate in the renewables and the drawdown and all the various elements of industry that are needed to provide the solutions, unless they were growing at about 30% per annum every year, in other words, that was the trajectory, and that that was started by no later than, guess what year? 2014. <coughs> which is kind of familiar, um, or at least it's familiar for a few more months and then it won't be, um, that unless we, we got it started by 2014, that we would be out of time to reach the too hot two degrees cap. Right, OK. They had a footnote in the summary and in the report which said, oh, by the way, if we don't get it done in that time, the only option left, apart from complete failure, is to go into wartime mobilisation mode. And then they didn't say anything more about that. Anyway, I filed the report away in 2009 because I knew that we were unlikely to get our shit together in, in time. And I got it out of, out of the computer file last year and started to talk to people about it. So the thing is, if we, if we have to do a wartime mobilisation, we better start thinking about what it means and how you actually make it a politically salient idea. Hence the, hence the connection with, with the elections. Right at the moment, it's absolutely true that if you went out and talked to most people um, and most politicians, they would say that there is absolutely no political traction around the idea of having a wartime mobilisation. Right? OK, that's our problem. That's the problem we now have to start to work on. Um, the other thing is, we have to look at what, what, a, what a wartime mobilisation is and why it's different from what we're currently doing. Um, you cannot get to the kind of fast change... I mean. Imagine the BZE reports. Okay, there's three, four of them out now. Um, by the time the whole economy is covered, there'll be some more. So we'll have this encyclopedia of what we need to do to actually solve the problem. Just imagine, like in every one of those reports, how many campaigns are there? Several per page, quite often. How many pages are there? Encyclopedia. So there's 3,482 years worth of campaigning in those reports, some of which have been written, some of which haven't been written yet. And I've analysed exactly how many years of campaigning is involved. Um, you can't deliver that in the time required to get a safe climate, so therefore we have to do something else. We have to sell the package. We actually have to sell the wartime mobilisation. So that's, I think, what our political demand needs to be. Um, and this has got to be reflected as a new political paradigm to drive the emergency speed climate rescue approach. Now, at the moment, for this election, we've got three struggles going on. We've got an absolutely crucial struggle <coughs> to get rid of a denialist government, because they're smashing through everything. You know, all the, all the, the relatively few good things that were, were there, they're smashing their way through with a bit of help from, from the national government. So it's really important 
that the, um, the Naptown government is turfed out at the next election. If we don't turf them out, we'll have to turf them out at a later election, but in their current incarnation, until they suddenly become decay or reborn, they're, they, they're, their only useful place is out of, out of office. Right, OK. Now, the next struggle, which we have to fight at the same time, um, although, I mean, some people would see it as one after the other, after these three struggles, one after the other in, in a sequence, but you can run the three together. The second one is, if we just simply try to get rid of the Natalian government and just say, well, Labor's better, which is the point that Adrian was making earlier, um, then that's just a free kick for Labor, who don't really have to do very much, and they're, they're keeping as low a profile as possible at the moment just to um, you know, avoid not winning. And we don't really know what they're going to do on climate afterwards, but when you see what happened when Labor got in after um, Kennett was in, Labor never recovered its mojo. Um, the kane Kerner government was far more radical back in the 80s than the new Labor government was post-Kennett, because Kennett had shifted the goalposts. Now, at the moment, there's not a great deal of a sign that Labor is going to really shift the goalposts you know, way, way back again. Um, so the third struggle, it, sorry, the second struggle is between Labor and the Greens. The Greens are the only real threat to Labor from the constituency that, that um, Labor cares about in terms of stability. So that's critical. The third struggle is the one that's not on the political agenda at all at the moment, and this is in, in ultimately is actually the main game, at, although at the moment it's not even on the radar screen, and that is to get the commitment to an emergency mobilisation. Now, what's really interesting is that um, the Greens, for example, have um, since at least 2009, um, uh, Adam Bant and Christine Milne have both consistently been saying we are facing a climate emergency and you'll see their press releases and their public statements along those lines. However, in the last couple of years, I've been saying to anybody from the Greens that I can find, why don't we talk about not just that we're in a climate emergency problem, but that we're going to propose climate emergency solutions. Or call it what you will, but, but put the content. The, so far, I haven't been able to get anybody from the Greens to actually say that we need a program of action that amounts to an emergency response. They admit the problem, which is fantastic, but they won't put forward the solutions. Now, we have to get it... So the question is, why not? Why don't they do it? Um, and you can work out all sorts of different reasons. But one of the reasons, which is in our hands, is there's no particular electoral advantage to them to say it at the moment. I mean, in fact, the reason why they don't say it, half the time the people who do care about climate won't say it because they actually think there might be an electoral disadvantage in saying it. Now, that's, to a to, to significant extent, that's our fault. OK. Um, the World War II mobilisation worked because people were strongly motivated by fear and they also had an amazing level, unity of purpose and also the propagandists on, on each side would then also up the ante around, you know, we're doing this for freedom and you know, all the good things in life and so they would have a positive reason for doing it as well as just being shit scared they're all going to die and be taken over by somebody else. But the crucial thing is that the reason why you could mobilise an economy so far and so fast was because people had a strong sense of common purpose. And so, therefore, if we translate that across to the fact that we have to deliver an emergency response to restore a safe climate, we have to get the same level of unity. Now, this has major political implications because we need a supermajority of strong support. The reason, why, the reason why any government, no matter who they were, whether they were Joseph Stalin or whether they were Churchill or Roosevelt or... A curtain or anybody you care to name, the reason why they they um, had to sorry the reason why they could get things done was because even their political opponents would let them get on with the job most of the time. Especially if you're in in, in under Stalin. <laughs> um, anyway, now I think one of the crucial things is at the moment we're puzzled by the fact that the right wing don't care about how, how are we going for time by the way. Another five minutes. Okay, great. Um, a lot of people are really puzzled. No, not puzzled. They're not puzzled. This is the problem. A lot of people are not puzzled by the fact that the right wing doesn't support um, really strong climate action. Okay? Now, 
um, I have the, the one advantage of being moderately ancient, which is that I was alive <coughs> at a time when, if you knew that somebody was an environmentalist, you, you could not predict their politics. Now, that was back in the, you know, basically sort of back 30 or 40 years ago. You could not predict people's politics, um, sorry, you could not predict um, their politics from knowing that they were environmentally minded. And there has been a very strong cultural shift in the last 10, 20, 30 years, which now creates a reality that everybody <coughs> under a certain age thinks is actually how human nature is, and it's just simply not true. I mean, it just, it just isn't true. So, how do we, what would happen? If you took all the lefties in the, in the world and took them on sabbatical to, I don't know, Mars or something for, <coughs> for a few years, what would happen is that the only people left on Earth would be the right-wingers, and the following thing would play itself out. First of all, the fossil fuel industry would have a field day because they would have got rid of most of their opponents and they would just go flat at it. Amazingly, the climate problem would not disappear. It didn't go to Mars along with the lefties. It stayed on Earth. Connected to what? Or possibly to the carbon dioxide. Um, anyway, so the climate problem would be continuing and then what would happen is that insurance companies would start to go broke or would have to start whacking up their premiums. The military would, have, would be fighting each other, all their right-wingers would be fighting other right-wingers <coughs> from other parts of the world. And eventually they'd start to say, look, I think there's some kind of correlation going on here. And so they would get their right-wing scientists <coughs> together with their right-wing insurance agents and their right-wing actuaries and their right-wing engineers and they would sit down and they would figure out what is the problem, and they're scientists, right-wing scientists, and they would figure out what the problem was. There wouldn't be any right-wing scientists left. <laughs> no, there would, be, there would be some, because they, they, would have to, they would have to invent them again. <laughs> but you could afford to invent them again, because you're all right-wing together, so therefore they're not a threat anymore. Until they start to realise that climate change is a problem, at which point the right-wing would break into two factions. There'd be the action on climate change faction, and there'd be the, the non-action. Mm -hmm. And eventually people would decide whether they actually thought it was more important to survive than it was to maintain a particular set of ideologies or religious beliefs or combination of the two. So, in other words, what I'm really saying is that the issue is not tied to politics. It's tied... At the moment, the reason why the right wing are locked in against us is because partly they are driven by the fossil fuel industry, of course, who has a direct vested interest, and partly it's because whatever we say, if we're lefties, they don't like. So of course they have to be against what we're saying. So the critical thing for politics is we will not succeed in this, in this challenge unless we facilitate a process of mobilising on the right and that we do something that we never do, which is that normally when we deal with conservatives or people up in the high, high end of town or the, you know, the elite, is we assume we must water down our message in order to communicate with them. But what we've got to do is find people on the right who are realists and who are prepared to face the facts and face the realities and then we help them get going on that and then they have got to lead the charge in their own community because they're not going to take it from us. How much... It, let's say there was some really important thing that was actually true and by some incredible coincidence Andrew Bolt came, came uh, across it. Right? And he then put in his column or somewhere on his TV program, he actually said something that was true. <laughs> would you believe it? I would not. Because I would think that everything Andrew Bolt says is what he normally says, which is a pack of crap. Now, the thing is, the reason why people can't on the right can't <coughs> understand environment is because most of the people they see saying it have, have been carefully branded as being in some other ideological camp. It was really crucial to read that badge <coughs> scientists as being left-wing, and most of them couldn't even work out what wing they had. And that, so in other words, we've got to get people going on the right to mobilise themselves. It's got to be peer-to-peer. -peer. You've got to take it from people you trust and you believe in. Um, now, not all the people who are green are in the Greens. Um, that's really important. It's not having a crack at the Greens. I mean, it's fantastic that the Greens are pushing forward and, and getting these issues on the agenda, but it's crucial for our success that we have to mobilise across a supermajority across left, right, middle and everything else. Now, this is roughly what our politics looks like at the moment. You've got 
um, let's say this would be sort of a bit like a Greens profile, the people here. You know, they tend, tend to be towards the left. There's a bit of a correlation. They tend to be towards the left. They're pretty environmentally minded, etc. <coughs> and then as you go across, you find that it switches. And you sort of start to feel pretty lonely over here. But what's really interesting is there actually are there are environmentally minded right wingers right across the spectrum. You'll get libertarians, you'll get you know right wing social conservatives, get every bloody stripe you like almost, and you'll find some sort of somebody who actually is able to combine the two. These people, these greens on on the right, are gold. We've got to find them, and we've got to help them mobilise because they're the only people who can start to do really something significant about these people here. It's not, it's not us, it's going to be somebody else. And we've got to find these people and we've got to help them get moving. Um, we need to work on the grassroots level, we need to work with the elites. We need to work with the elites that are not tied to the climate destruction paradigm, which means not the fossil fuel industry, but everybody else. If you do the maths, you'll find that um, the fossil fuel industry... Sorry, who thinks the fossil fuel industry is big and powerful and rich? Okay, I'll flip it around the other way. Who thinks the fossil fuel industry is not big and powerful and rich? Okay, that's, that's <laughs> right. Who feels slightly intimidated by the fossil fuel industry? Okay, who doesn't feel intimidated by them at all? Okay, good on you. You're completely insane, but you... you. <laughs> but have, did, you, did you know that the fossil fuel industry controls precisely about 10% of the entire money in our Australian economy? Yes, but you should talk me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, maybe you wouldn't say. Maybe, oh, whatever. Okay. They control 10% of the actual money. The reason why they're so powerful is because they have influence across a much larger stretch of the economy. And they have convinced a whole bunch of other people in the elites that it's in their interest to protect the fossil fuel industry. Not the least because they're important for exports. But, you know, it's the Australian way, it's blah, 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 there's a whole lot of things. The networks are intensely strong. They control the fossil fuel industry invests time and effort in, in organising throughout industry associations to make sure that nobody else can have a different point of view. Okay. If you then analyse what's the interests of every other bit of, of, of industry, society, economy, other than the fossil fuel industry, <coughs> the interest of everybody else is to solve the climate problem. Like That's actually their objective interest. Because you can plug and play. You can pull out fossil fuels and put in something else, efficiency and renewables. You don't need fossil fuels. So they're dispensable. So everybody else can get on with it, and so therefore they can relate to the climate issue in, in direct terms. Now, at the moment, the 90%... Sorry, let's say, let's say there's another 20% who are of the economy that's so used to working with the fossil fuel sector that they just can't imagine that they don't have the same interests. So that still brings you up to 30%. If 70% of the economy can't crunch 30%, I don't know what's wrong. I asked Ross Garner, why didn't the 70% crunch the 30? And he said, they're not organised. They're not organised. OK? Now, now we, now we can see what our job is in the elites. It's not to water down the message. It's to actually ramp up the understanding that the 70% of the elite that's going along with the fossil fuel industry despite its own, its own interests is being screwed by these other people in precisely the same way as we are, you know, in the grassroots being screwed by the fossil fuel industry. And so we should be able to break the power of the fossil fuel industry, even in a place like Australia, if we can get that realisation. Now that's going to require a tremendous amount of networking and a tremendous amount of not watering down what we're saying. Um, I'll leave that and I think I've probably finished. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dylan. We'd like to form a panel with our three speakers now and take some questions. We can take questions until 8 o'clock when we're going to call it quits. So do we have any questions? One here. Some years ago, quite a few years ago, I heard Phil and Adam arguing that the Greens should do a deal with the Liberals uh, because uh, they were taken for granted by Labor. You know, times have changed a little bit um, since then. Um, was that ever a good idea? And might it still be a good idea? 
Um, so maybe it would have been a good idea when, like Adrian was saying, there were people in the Liberal Party who were open to something like well, climate change. But I think that the the situation that we have with the Liberal Party now, I can't see any situation where the Greens could do a deal with the Liberal Party simply because they've been so taken over by the denialists and um, just looking at it objectively in terms of the policies, like Labor are really bad, but the Liberals are worse. <coughs> so we saw when I worked on Bromley, like I said before, there are a whole bunch of things that I was really upset about and then just came into the fossil fuel industry, but at least they had some renewables policy, you know, that's probably the only good thing they had, but um, the Liberals have just like ripped it all up and you can't even say the public service now climate change, you have to say climate variability. <laughs> That's the the um, memo that they've given to all the public servants. So maybe uh, I think that yeah, it, it's true that Labor's not always better than the Liberals, but at the moment the Liberals are filled with denialists. So I don't see how it's going to do So I'd just like to add a little comment on that. The <coughs> problem, let's say hypothetically, like Captain Mike. <coughs> the problem is if you make a deal, it's obviously not going to be for the climate emergency solution package. And then <coughs> the danger with that is that we get a situation where, say, post the, the Greens ALP um, sort of rug deal that was the 5% thing, it was sort of like a relief valve that got left, left on the climate change campaign. It's like, oh, that sort of does it. If you were to make a deal, you would have to qualify it and say, this is the best we got in a really worse situation. It's no way near what we need. It's terrible. We're still going to die. And we really like you vote for us next time. And if you don't do that, you're going to end up in a situation where three years go past and, and the, the vast majority think it's sort of okay because the deal's been done. Does that make sense? So and if it was a Save the Planet person in there and we were holding balance of power, we would say, climate emergency or we, you don't get our vote. And we'll go back to the election. Simple as that. And we do it again and again and again and again until we the public work up. Did you want to add to that yeah, I think that at the moment the thing to do is not to spend much time talking about the hierarchy in the Liberal Party or the Nationals, but to talk to the voters who vote Liberal or National Party. Um, I mean, they're the critical people to reach because they're not being represented very well by their own side of politics. Um, and that can lead either to those with thicker skins and, 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 and thicker skulls you know, to take the blows, going into the Liberals and Nationals and taking the fight up to them inside, or it might lead them to you know, find other avenues um, or whatever, or it might lead people to decide that they'll you know, stand for the Liberals but then cross the floor um, you know, to back stuff that needs to be done, or whatever. I mean, there's probably lots of different strategies. But I wouldn't waste my time with the hierarchy because at the moment the hierarchy is a wholly owned subsidiary of the fossil fuel industry, if it's not or whatever. And so until that changes, um, there's really nothing much to, to lever, you know, to, to lobby on. Uh, but there's, uh, there's an enormous um, there's an enormous scope for work in, in, in the grassroots on the right. For example, um, in the suburbs such as uh, Hawthorne, Kew, Glenaris, Malvern, you know that kind of whole area down along the bayside, um, they they have the largest quantity of remaining small mill liberals in the country. They also have the largest uh, membership of the Liberal Party in any place in Australia. And if they got, if they got, you know, sort of a bit, sort of wild, they would be a force to be reckoned with within the Liberal Party. So we should talk to them, not to the hierarchy. And similarly, in the Nationals, so you look at somewhere like <coughs> Victoria, where the Nationals are in a really difficult position now because there's a whole bunch of coal seam gas licences that that companies want to exploit on people's farmland, and people all of a sudden say, "No, wait a minute, all these lifelong national folks are saying, no way, I don't want." some gas on my land and they're coming over to Greens or other parties who will put a moratorium on cost in gas. So it's an interesting way you can kind of get into the <coughs> groups and say, look, the Nationals aren't representing you or drag the Nationals over to, to um, put pressure on the lips or something like cost and gas. Okay, another question here. Yeah, look, I just want to perhaps all of you take the theme of this further. Why are we not seeing farmers so strongly representing <coughs> climate activists in Victoria. I appreciate that there's some of the anti-coal seed gas movement has, has uh, 
farmers in, but I'm interested in agricultural production and drought and so on. Why is it that, that farmers are banging the drum harder on, on climate change? Any, any thoughts or anything? Um, has anyone read Don't Think of an Elephant by George Lakoff? It's, it's a really interesting book written by <coughs> Uh, kind of messaging and political psychology guru from the States. And I can't really give you his thesis in a couple of sentences, but essentially he unpacks why people are conservative or progressive. And because you do sometimes look at it and think, well, if you ask someone their position on something, you can, like, you can pretty much tell what the Liberals' position will be on something versus the Greens' position on something, but it doesn't always really make a lot of sense. Like, you think, <coughs> okay, farmers, yes, they vote national, and the nationals are against climate change. You know, but wait a minute, why is that? That doesn't actually make any sense. Why are they against climate change and... Because they're owned by the fossil fuels. Yeah, but there's also, I think, a deeper kind of political psychology lesson here about why people split into conservatives and progressives. And it has to do with kind of, um, yeah, world view. <coughs> this book lays it out really interestingly around people's world, yeah, people's world views. You can't really explain it without reading the book, but I think Philip's absolutely right. They're probably you know, owned by the fossil fuel industry and take huge donations from the fossil fuel industry. But I think there's also something in the political psychology about why people um, kind of understand <coughs> two different camps. I've worked on the Beyond Zero Emissions plan <coughs> for a while, and did quite a bit of slide at the same time I did my Master Tree Growers course and spent a lot of time with farmers and all sorts of stuff. Now, and yeah, anecdotally, going out and visiting half farmers to fight. Huge numbers of them get climate change. Like we were at a, a farm of heaps of really old guys, like 88 year old guys who've got their records that have been taken since the 1800s sometimes. One farm in the same family, daily better records. We'll say climate change is undoubtedly changing. I think it's Alan's got the point. It's about values. And what's happening is climate change is not overriding their perception of the broader need to vote nationals and for people or whatever. And ideally, what, you know, what we need is the right wing climate change vote. And that could solve a lot of our problems. And part of the Save the Planet strategy is to be politic, try and be left, right, political, neutral, and concentrate on climate change to avoid some of that sort of reason why those guys won't vote green. Yeah, and I wasn't very clear before, but I guess what I want to say is that I think climate change has been boxed into a progressive issue, which has been a problem. So therefore, as I think Philip was saying, that people who look at climate change think, oh, that's a progressive issue. I'm not one of those people. I'm a conservative national voter, so therefore climate change fits into that box doesn't fit into my box. And that um, is quite dangerous that we haven't been able to spread climate change across all of them. And you know, the progressive mindset and political philosophy is much more about collectivism and looking after everyone, having kind of an optimistic view of human nature and our ability to work together. Whereas the conservative view is much more um, what he calls a strict father family view which is all about um, you know people need to be kind of told what to do and it's quite authoritarian and so climate change is kind of fit into this collectivism we can all you know pitch in on the company ever after kind of box and it hasn't fit into their political philosophy box. We've got one towards back there, yes. Um, two points. Could you please talk from the centre of the room? Because <laughs> we get a little more straight on. And I just wondered, in the sense of um, superannuation, everyone's going to have some. It surely is a long term thing. Is there any way of getting that industry to uh, speak rationally to everyone? <coughs> We tried this at AYCC. We tried to run some campaigns around super. It was very difficult to find a super fund who actually didn't invest in fossil fuels. Um, I think Australian Ethical was about the closest, but they still did invest in some gas, I think. And then there are a couple of people I know now that are starting new super companies explicitly saying that they won't invest in fossil fuels. Um, I think that even the superannuation industry should get it, the insurance industry should get it, the renewables industry should get it, but I don't think they really, really get it. So I think it's the same problem with, it's within their interest to do something, but I think they're still quite short-term thinkers, particularly the renewables industry. I've been really disappointed with a lot of the bigger renewable energy industries. <coughs> yes, some of them have a lot of um, investment in fossil fuels as well, so that taints their position, but some of them that have 
a real financial interest in, say, keeping the renewable energy target will not advocate for themselves. And I think it's a real shows a real lack of courage and a real lack of forward thinking. Matthew Wright, the co-founder of Beyond Zero Emissions, is one of his projects post being director, um, executive director, is doing exactly setting up a pure renewable super fund as a sub option within an existing large fund. And you know, then once that gets set up, it'd, it'd be an excellent way to get people to disinvest. And there's a lot of disinvestment campaigns around banks and all sorts of things going everywhere. I'm not involved in it, but tomorrow night, 350.org and market forces are launching something to do with Super Switch, exactly mm. that really mm. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So, um, you need to. Next question is down the front here. Then we've got one over there. One day. I've got sort of several, several comments. Firstly, political attitudes shouldn't be treated as just one dimensional left right. It's more complicated. Organization just dies. Mm. As, it, as we have seen. Yeah, and you would remember in part of my talk I said that this is not the only thing that is going to solve climate change, but this is the thing that I feel is the highest leverage opportunity for me in my life right now, and that we need so much more. And you're right, we absolutely need the movement. And I come from a social movement. And when I thought it was effective for me to be in a social movement around climate change, I did that. And then I made a decision to go into politics. And I'm sure that I'll go back and forth many times throughout my life. And the thing that stuck with me from Philip's talk that he said is that it's hard for the Greens to do everything because they need a political reason to, to do something. So, it is quite hard for the Greens to go out there, as Philip said, and said, we need this climate emergency solution. I admit that is hard to say when you think that people might not vote for you when you say that. So being in politics is about getting votes. And that's what it is, right? That's about getting votes. So although we have very strong morals and there are things that we will never compromise on, at the same time, sometimes as a political party, you need a political reason to do something. Not to say that we're going to go to the right and, and you know there are things that we'll never compromise on, but at the same time, if you don't have a social movement dragging you to the left as well, it's really difficult. And something that frustrates me um, since being in the Greens is that <coughs> there often aren't people to the left of us or whatever, you, you know, call it the left or the more radical, the more sensible, whatever you want to call it, but there aren't, there isn't really a big movement who's out there saying, actually, this is what we need. So then the Greens can kind of be the moderates who, you know, are in the middle negotiating with Labor to get something that's a bit shit, but then it gets dragged to the left again. That doesn't happen. Often the Greens are the ones who are out with the most scientifically based solution. And if you look at something like the, um, the Murray River Basin Plan, the Greens were calling on, and I can't remember the exact numbers, but it was whatever gigalitres to be put back into the river. And we were saying, this is what the scientific reports say need to put in the river. The Liberals are saying, no, nah, no, nah, you just, you know, say it's a scale, we're saying we need 10, and the Liberals are saying, no, nah, no, nah, you just need one. The science is 10. The Greens are saying, science is 10, we need 10. The Environment Movement came in, ACF, and said, oh, we'll settle for six. Mm. And we go, how on earth, if the Environment Movement, who was just supposed to care about the environment, if they're saying we only need six, how on earth are the Greens supposed to argue for anything more than six? I brought that up in my talk, remember? The Environment yeah, Movement so self suicides self before it starts. So it's... The Greens... I'm not saying that the Greens are the only solution. The Greens are, I think, an important element of the solution now and the thing that I've chosen now because I think it's a high-leverage opportunity. But... You need so much more and you need the movement there holding the Greens to account, pushing them in the right direction, dragging them to the sensible solution so that they can actually have the space to create some solutions in the middle. Okay. We take a question? Oh, I just oh, want to make a comment, that's right. Okay. So, um, yeah, so just very quickly, absolutely right, we need a social movement, a fundamental, and part of Save the Planet is to exist as a social movement, to blend the politics and the social movement, and to fill a void, which is other than BZE, there's really not that many groups campaigning on the climate emergency position. So we, we said, fuck it, we're not going to wait for someone to do it. We will be the politics and the social movement and try and do it ourselves. But it is crazy when... I mean, I was lobbying... After I resigned my job, because I was told to campaign on 60% by 2050, I'd lobby Christine Milne to go to 80% by 2050 when she was the climate spokesperson for the Greens. And 
Christine said, we can't lead the environment movement. And I said, why? Like, why can't you lead? Like, politics, there's two ways you can get votes. You can get votes by following the trend, or you can make the trend. And I think politicians have forgotten how to make the trend. And, and when, we, when we ran the Otway, we, I'm one of the key people in the Greater Otway National Park campaign, and we never followed trends. We said, what do we want? What's going to work? How do we message it? How do we get the change? And we led, right? And within three years, we had everyone in Geelong saying, don't log, log our forest because it destroys our water catchments. No one knew that before then, but we, we didn't follow, we led. And people have forgot how to lead. And this is leadership. And when I was talking to Christine, I pointed out that, well, if she wants leadership, she just has to look at Arnold Schwarzenegger because he's already put into law an 80% by 2050, but that wasn't good enough, Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> but anyway, so it's, it's, I find it the biggest frustrating element of the whole thing. The leadership, and I think Ellen can lead. She could get up there and fucking go sick as a politician if you win. But there's only, there is only so much you can take it without support. So I, I completely agree. I mean, Abbott did it right. He just went out there and said all this crazy stuff, and um, was able to kind of drag people to that position. For example, on refugees. But I think at the same time, you can't often do it without support. Yeah, climate change will get worse and eventually they'll understand. <laughs> so that's the... I don't want to do yeah. it. I knew it will. <laughs> yeah, our next question is... Yeah, I'd just like to comment on um, uh, using leverage. There's not that many of us in the room here to go and uh, talk to all our neighbours and, and bring them around, but I was thinking about some of the newer social movements that become social movements, like uh, Shut the Gate and Blaze Aid. Um, the... Is there any direct contact between like PZE and trying to influence the, the movers and shakers and those types of organisations as, as, as a bigger form of leverage? So Lock the Gate is overtly non-political, right? So it, it, it's, you cannot... We have Say the Planet people who wanted to be candidates but because they campaigned through them, stepped down from being, not being candidates. So there's a great opportunity that I think is missed and it's self-sabotage. So, yeah, it'd be great... Yeah, I... We, there, there is stuff going on, and there are they're very sophisticated. So down in East Gippsland at the moment, the Lock the Gate crew are running four candidates from a, from a political spectrum spread of independents on the right to, and the fourth person will be a Save the Planet candidate, like hardcore climate change. And they're trying to patch it to try and attack Peter Ryan in his seat. So there's some really sophisticated stuff going on in some parts, but then, then there's some really silly stuff going on where at some levels the group say... No, we're not going to do politics. That's that's true. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Next question is over here. I just just as a couple of things today in the age, I think it was the United Church stated that they were going to de uh, get out of fossil fuel investment. Mm. So I think there is potential there. I look at two la very large multinational companies. Well, not multinational. One's multinational. One's a very large company, which I hate in a lot of respects, and that's Walmart. When you actually look what Walmart has done to reduce their carbon footprint, it is phenomenal. Yeah. I think we've got to stop having this attitude of left and right because it's crap. We've got to get, I mean, not only have to get people to move, but you also have to aim at the companies because companies are in, in it for one thing, and that's to make profit. 3M makes more profit by being greener than they were making than they were. Walmart is making more profit by being greener. You can walk into a Walmart in the States, they don't have the lights going during the day. They have skylights. They spent all a huge amount of money painting their roofs white because it reduced their carbon input. They didn't need as much energy to keep their stores cool in the summer. They spent a fortune training their truck drivers how to drive properly. They spent a lot of money on changing their refrigerator trucks so they didn't have to run the engines 24-7. I think we need to not only aim at the grassroots politically, but I think we also should be aiming at the companies. Because let's face it, the right, or the, all the investors, they want one thing. They want more profit. And if we can teach companies how to make more profit by being green, they'll do it. But you've also got to change the system they operate in, because they'll, they'll be able to be a certain amount green. And then they'll just run out, like they'll run into their profitability barrier. And they'll just it's go that far and go <coughs> further. So, you, hang on, hang on. Isn't it better that we get them 20% of the way uh, than at the moment having the fossil fuel lobby saying, don't go anyway? 
No, no, I, I totally agree that it's really good to be able to encourage good behaviour across the spectrum of whoever people are in whatever situation they're in. Okay, I agree with that. But I think we have to also have an eye to the speed of change required, the scale of change, and that's why I'm saying that I think... Actually, I'll say it again, like it's Adrian's point, say it again and again and again. Mm. There is no way that we can solve the climate problem unless we go onto a wall footing. Okay. Now. Right? Like really soon, really soon, as soon as we can make it happen. So the thing is that what we have to do is find a way to get, get that starting to get traction and to actually start thinking about how you do it. Like the complement to the BZE work, you've got this stack of reports which show what you could do to solve a, a large proportion of the climate problem. You cannot single issue campaign those things into existence. You're going to have to sell them. I mean, you, we need single issue campaigns as educational things, as a way of engaging, a way to give people a sense of concretely, you know, I can concretely give effect to my belief in a, an emergency response by doing these immediate things. But with, a bit, I mean, a bit like getting rid of apartheid, that was always a mixture of um, the system disenfranchised all black people, people mm -hmm. of colour as well, in general. So the system needed to be changed. But people have found it very hard to believe it was going to change any time quickly. So at the same time, they campaign on particular issues. But there was always this notion that the basic fundamental structure was wrong and it needed to be changed. Part of the way through the campaign leading up to what in fact turned out to be the end of apartheid, there was the, um, the nationalist government offered a tricameral parliament. Now, if people had been into their, into their oh, something's better than nothing mode, they would have said, oh, we'll go for a tricameral parliament. But because they actually had a vision, enough of the key leaders had a vision of where they really needed to be, that when they were offered that, that you know, partial compromise, they said, no, no, we actually want a place where everybody's got a right to be a citizen, mm. you know, a full citizen. Mm. And so they stuck with that, that goal, and, and then they went from there. So I, I agree that we, there is enormous opportunity to, to relate to people right across the political spectrum and up and down the elites, and, in every part of society, the only part that's going to be really, really hard is going to be in the fossil fuel in industry itself. But even those organisations have defectors who leave. Mm -hmm. Like one of the people I work with closely is Joe Herbertson, who used to head the research labs for BHP, and he was a coal person. He used to work on steel production. What about him? Hmm? Yeah, he Dunlop. and Dunlop. He, uh, he used to be head of the coal council. These people have gone across to the light side, um, and. So that happens, but, but the system still reproduces itself. Joe doesn't work in the lab, some other bug is in there doing it instead. Okay, so and we've got to change that system. And it, look, and there's a guy called Mike that, that there's part of what you're saying, like that's been that sort of stuff. The 1990s was the 3M story about how they greened themselves to save lots of money. And there are heaps of commercial people who make money by saving companies money. And there's a whole industry doing that. There's a guy called Michael Smith in Canberra who wrote a book called The Natural Edge Project with a number of other people. He's, he specialises in that and he's, he's writing how do you turn a dry cleaners into a zero emission dry cleaners? How do you turn a, a milk bar or whatever? So he's, he's developing those packages and we'll put them out through the Breakthrough website at some point as concrete examples of how a small business when frustrated with the lack of government motivation, movement, etc., can actually take it as far as they can. So, but yeah. regulation is important with, in terms of a lot of those companies change because there's a financial incentive for them to change and a lot of the way you get financial incentive to become green ace through regulation like putting a price on carbon. And you said we need to get rid of left and right. I think that's exactly what these two have been arguing for is that we need climate solutions across the entire political spectrum and to take it out of just the left paradigm. Okay, another question off the back there, I think? Please. Uh, to the guys who are candidate, uh, candidates in the upcoming election, um, I've been trying to help the Greens in different constituencies. You're obviously thin on the ground. Um, how are you going to push your resources so that you, you get across the line in constituencies where you've got the strongest choice? Or how are you, you know, what kind of constituency are you going to focus on? There's, um, there's only so many people. Uh, I went door knocking with one person in in a constituency the other day, I don't, you know, I think that's diluting your chances uh, of getting a seat. Uh, you know, I agree we need people like you to be able to show, uh, you know, I don't think Labour are really interested in, certainly the Liberals are not interested in this, this area, but what, what are you going to do to ensure that you get 
asleep, particularly the Greens? Mm. It's a very good question. And um, as you probably know, we don't have big donations from fossil fuel companies or developers, so we don't have money for lots of advertising. So we are focusing on door knocking, one on one conversations. It's what won Adam Bant his seat at the federal election, so we know it works. And you're absolutely right, I worry about the dilution of resources every single day. We've got door knockers out every weekend, but we need a lot more than we have to reach our targets. We need to knock on 35,000 doors, and I think we're up to about you know, almost 10,000 now, but you know, we need a lot more. Um, the Greens obviously make try and make strategic decisions about we'll have a couple of priority seats. So our priorities this time in the up house, the three we already have, which is the western suburbs, northern suburbs, and south southern suburbs and then Western Victoria to potentially win another one and Eastern, the Eastern suburbs. So we've got two priorities in the upper house and then two in the lower house, which is Melbourne and Paran. We've decided are our best chances. There are obviously other campaigns, particularly around Brunswick, Richmond, Northcote that have a chance, but not as much of a chance. And so it is hard when you're diluting the, the door knockers across the whole of the inner north. So, I mean, obviously for me, I'd say please come and door knock in Melbourne because it is literally a few hundred votes in it and door knocking can make the difference between winning and losing and it's not a done deal. Um, but, of course, I would say that. But it is a... You know, Melbourne has been identified as a priority for the party and I hope that volunteers can concentrate themselves enough so that we don't have people door knocking in Labor Liberal seats or the Greens are never going to get up. Oh, just re really quickly, say, say the plan, we're at that. The Greens don't have heaps of money, they have corporate money, but at least they get fed electoral, yeah, mm -hmm. federal funding and state funding, so they get dollars per votes, which you can spend to and stuff like that. Say the plan's at the opposite end. We only exist because, unfortunately, my dad died, but that meant there was some money freed up, and that paid for our federal election campaign, and will pay for part of our state election campaign. But I think we're over hurdle. But we're, we're back when I was agreeing, you know, Greens vote was 1.8%. There was one person plus two helpers working electorates, you know, that sort of stuff. So we're back there just trying to do the best we can with the resource we've got. And, you know, we, we fought to get 600 people to sign up as members. Yet the Euthanasia Party got it easily, you know, like, anyway. So the climate, the climate stuff isn't resonating. That's the problem. So we've got to get out there and resonate it. So, and because all we can do is the best we can with the resource we've got, and we don't have much. Um, adding further on that, where yep. are you running and are you happy to give preferences to the Green? Uh, yep. or okay, so I'm, so I'm personally running in the upper house seat of the West with Lloyd, um, with the Green. So um, we have candidates running in um, Brunswick and Northcote and Mombolk and um, the upper house seat of the North, uh, the Northern region. So it's Greg Barber's seat for the Greens. and. Um, and more coming, hopefully. And not, Philip not sort Prime. of, huh? Not Prime. No, not yet. So if anyone lives in Prime wants to run in Prime, see me afterwards. Um, and not joking. And um, and yeah, so that's where we're at. We'll probably get a few more. Um, and how we don't do preference deals, we simply uh, look at all the different parties' policies and say what's the strongest. Who's a climate emergency person? who's not a climate emergency person, who's this, who's that, and we rank them and then we give the preferences accordingly. We don't give a sh we don't care at all where someone preferences us. So when we, we meet and discuss preferences and what we say, like when we met with the Greens, we say, last time you put me 15 below the sex party who prefaced against you, wasn't that silly, where climate change, why not put us a bit higher and they put us number two last time. So we have a discussion but not a deal-making thing. We say if you want to go higher, you can do X, Y, and Z. But that's not a deal, it's just a statement of fact. I think there's an interesting tension. It's not just in political parties, but it's in the movement as well. It's like, how much do you diversify and try and fight a few different battles and hope that one of them will stick or hope that the diversity will add up to something greater? Or how much do you all just join together and fight for one thing? And my personal view is I think diversity is good because you can never guarantee that the one thing you pick is going to be the right thing. So I think it's good to have parties like say the Planet Party you know, pushing the line on climate and dragging some other parties over to that side but I do worry about the, the dilution of resources as well so hopefully hopefully volunteers can make an informed decision about well great let's get Greens elected in Melbourne let's try and increase Save the Planet over here or get Labor 
in this labour liberal marginal and, and make some strategic decisions rather than and just spreading themselves. Really quickly, most of our people are not Greens voles, so we're dragging new resources into the campaign as we see. Okay, we're running short of time. We've got time for two more questions. One here and one over there. So I'll take this one here. Um, just a quick suggestion in the left versus right. Can we follow what Philip said and just make it light versus dark and, and bring <laughs> that into common parlance as a recognition that the liberals are the dark side and play on that? <laughs> I, I, I think it's really important to say what's wrong with the liberals. It's that they're backing the destruction of the planet. And that's pretty bad. It's not a light, it's not a light dark. I mean, the thing is, if we get into cliches, we actually lose the reason why. We don't hate the Liberals because they just happen to have the word liberal on them. Because in some places, like in America, liberals are the good thing to be kind of stuff. Um, we hate the Liberals because they're, they're backing the destruction of the planet. And we hate the Labor Party for being halfway you know, from the camp, and we think the Greens would step up harder if they did more, whatever. So we've got, we've, we've got nuanced judgments about everybody, including ourselves. So, I think the crucial thing is to actually mobilise people who want to save the world, save the planet, in the various parties. So we, we need a climate emergency grouping operating in the, in the Labor Party. We need... The problem with the Labor Party is they've got a culture of compromise. Like, it's actually really deeply ingrained. Yeah. And yet, sustainability issues depend on you not compromising. And so, therefore, the, the fundamental character of their, of their philosophy just won't help them with this stuff. The help that you can give the Labor Party is to go into it and help them recognise that some issues shouldn't be treated as something for compromise. That, that would help the Labor Party. We need another group to go into the Liberals and the Nationals. We need, we need people to get involved with the Greens and push them to actually go for a climate emergency response, not just the you know, we are in an emergency problem. So we need, we need people inside each of the tribes really pushing this stuff hard. And, and, I th and I, once again, there is no way that we can solve the problem unless we sell the total package and we have an industrial mobilisation to deliver a safe climate at emergency speed. That is the only way we're going to get out of the mess we're in. And that can't be done by single issue campaigning and small incremental steps. We have to find some way of relating to people about the whole package. And the only way to do that is to get out and actually put it to them and start the conversations about how to make that change because then they'll tell us what they don't understand about what the hell we're talking about and we'll start lifting our game in terms of our communication capability. And just really quickly, from the right's point of view, they are the light. Right? They, they believe in their value set. You know, so that's the, and we just don't understand each other. Some people in the middle do. Okay, one last question. What's your position on geoengineering? <laughs> Sorry? What's your position on geoengineering? Who wants to take on? Uh, so, <laughs> I, yeah, it, the, the, the bottom line is that we would... Start, if we start the climate emergency thing, we'd start it and we'd start rolling out as fast as possible. And the reality is we've probably gone, already gone too far that we're not going to save the planet unless we do geoengineering just because the ability to draw down lots of carbon is limited at this stage. And when someone finds a brilliant, really fast way to do it, then maybe we don't need any geoengineering, but perhaps it's going to be geoengineering anyway. So, yeah, it's um, literally, from my point of view, it's on the, on the cards because it's going to probably be impossible to save ourselves if we don't. And my view is that there's some geoengineering that's less risky than other forms of geoengineering. And there are some things that, um, if we do them, they might exacerbate the problems that we're trying to solve. Did you want to add to that? Yeah, yeah. Um, the way to get a, a natural safe climate is zero emissions and drawdown. You know, getting the CO2 out of the air. That's what we have to do. And under, under there is no safe climate scenario that, that doesn't include that. Right? Now, the, the, the drawdowns, Adrian said, uh, with current technology, is likely to be a several hundred year process. So the question is, how do we get through? How do we, and you know, 20 million other species on the planet, 6, 7 billion people and, and you know, 20 million species, how do we get through to the point where we've actually restored a natural safe climate? And at the moment, we actually don't know the answer to that science. I mean, we know possible ways of, of adding extra you know, cooling, geoengineering cooling, but we don't know the science about the, the, the net impacts. And so we actually need to know that. We need to get a really good grip on, on what the science of, of the yes, solar radiation, solar reflection management is, because um, it, 
it may be really critical. If it turns out that it's actually not a net benefit, then it should never be used. Does that make sense? Like if you don't need to do this, it's like, so it's like, uh, if it, sorry, if in medical terms, if you had cancer and somebody said, um, you know, are you going to try uh, chemotherapy or radiation therapy or something? I mean, most people would prefer not to do it. If you didn't have cancer, you'd never ever consider it under any circumstances, if that makes sense. So it's, it's not something to be going into lightly at all. And it may turn out that it's actually not a net benefit, in which case we don't use it, in which case a lot more people and a lot more species will go extinct than otherwise might have been the case if it turned out that it was, had a better beneficial effect. But we can only answer that once we know more about it. I think that um, because people have got the raw footing, it seems to me that geoengineering, as Carl Hamilton keeps saying, could be unilaterally done state or in my company, you know, it won't be a democratic decision by Parliament somewhere that will decide it. That's why I want to be able to do the real thing that's Yeah, there's two scenarios in which geoengineering could be used. One is kind of the, the Dr. Strange life scenario where people say climate change is not a problem and they deny it and deny it and deny it and they keep the fossil fuel industry going until finally the, the evidence is just so overwhelming and massive that people are like dying left, right and centre and eventually they have to for social stability, for reasons, for political stability of the ALF. And then when they decided that that's where they've got to, they would just simply run it over the top of us and we'll have no say. Right? That's the dystopian future, which is the one which we're currently heading towards. The only other one is one where people who actually care about people and species and have some sense, you know, committed to safety and committed to compassion and caring, look at it and say, is there any circumstance under which this would help us get back to a naturally self-managed, naturally managed, safe climate? Can geoengineering help us in that transition back? And if it can, we should consider it, but if it can't, then we should not. Does that make sense? Like, so, so there are two very, very different scenarios in which this thing can happen. If we fail, like the, the core thing on all safe climate scenarios is zero emissions immediately, and draw down as fast as you can go without starving people and without destroying nature. So, so those, that's the core of the safe climate model. And we have to get on with that. And if that movement is powerful enough finally to deliver that, it may well be powerful enough to make sure that geoengineering is not used in a foolhardy, particularly stupid way, which is what, what it's mostly being framed at at the moment. <coughs> How do you think our three panel speakers? <laughs> Probably end a talk with some action. So, do you want to just say the I'll thing people can do? I've got sign up sheets or join Vote Planet Online. Um, I'll say the Planet Online if you'd like. And my help. website's ellensandal.com. We do door knocks every week and also lots of activities during the week. So, if you'd like to help us win Melbourne, we could definitely use some more door knockers. And if anybody would like to work on working out how to, how to campaign in the community for the package, in other words, it's essentially, you know, for making this emergency response happen, then I'm working on that. So I'd love to work with other people. Okay, uh, this forum comes to you from VZD. VZD is a volunteer organisation. Um, even volunteer organisations take money to run them. There's computers needed for research and people have to have cups of coffee and so on. So if you enjoy these forums and would like to support VZD, we'd love to hear about it. There's some uh, information outside on the table for that. I'm sure that uh, Save the Planet could do with some funds and some help, and so could the Greens. And so could Philip. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, okay, I've got a couple of uh, plugs here. Um, we already have a mention, I think, of Mark Forces and 350.org for the launch of Super Switch at Federation Square at the Edge uh, on Tuesday, the 2nd of, of September. Tomorrow night. Tomorrow night, yes, at 6 pm. And um, this is one for Eastern Climate Action Melbourne is running a state election environment forum uh, with three candidates from the Forest Hill electorate, which is a marginal electorate, on Tuesday the 30th of September, um, uh, with some assistance from Whitehorse Council uh, and Environment Victoria, and some of these little leaflets outside on the table if you live in the eastern suburbs. And um, we will probably convene to the pub around the corner afterwards for a chat if anyone wants to take a bit further. Uh, the next discussion group is on Monday the 6th of October and we have Andrew Redaway, an energy analyst from the Assault Alternative Technology Association, the ATA, and he'll be presenting on the new Sunalator, which is some, free, uh, some software 
free software simulation tool that the ATA have worked up, which estimates the economic feasibility of a solar system on a particular route. Um, and this can also be used for large-scale community projects. Uh, and that's it. Thank you all very much for coming.